You are listening to the Our View podcast, where we aim to educate, raise awareness, and change the tone of conversation about disabilities. Every week, we bring you episodes that are centered around topics related to disabilities. As the host, it is my hope that you are not just inspired by these stories that are shared, but that you put some action behind your inspiration to do something that improves the lives of those who live with disabilities. I thank you, our loyal listeners, for your support and remind you to subscribe to our YouTube channel at Our View for Life and to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts to tell us what you enjoy most about the podcast. Let's get into this conversation. I would like to welcome everyone back to another episode of the Our View podcast, where we aim to educate, raise awareness, and change the tone of conversation about disabilities. I am happy to be joined today by my guest, Bryson. So Bryson, thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to see kind of where we can take this conversation and and where it ends up. Yes, yes. So um, to start off, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do? and um, some fun things that you enjoy doing in your free time, if you have any free time. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. So like you said, my name is Bryson Tarbett. Um, I am a full-time elementary music educator um, just outside of Columbus, Ohio. And in addition to teaching, I also run an online business called That Music Teacher, where I help other elementary music teachers kind of get the the professional development that they that they need to really make their classroom a place where, you know, they want to be um, and their students want to be. Um, and honestly, I don't have much free time because I tend to <laughs> fill it with more things. Um, but if I had to kind of think about something that I really enjoy doing, honestly, it would be coaching other teachers because, you know, like I just got back from a conference where it was all, I, my, I was presenting all about differentiation and removing barriers to access of the curriculum. And it was just, that's one of my passions is, you know, what, what can we put into place now to help students? And, you know, we talked a little bit about this earlier as we were kind of getting, you know, getting set up, but, you know, things that help one person often help more people. And I think that's something that we don't think about as much. Yes, that is so true. I, um, <clears throat> in addition to uh, hosting this podcast, I, also host a second podcast uh, for New Jersey Coalition for Inclusive Education. So um, the world of inclusive education is um, something I've I've been working there for a little over a year and a half now, Um, but it's something that I'm I'm learning a lot more about and um, really excited to see the way that things are going in a positive direction. Um, And just uh, knowing that, like like you said, people are out there to, make things better and to uh, break down those barriers that exist um, that might hinder people from, um, you know, from learning. And it's when we make things accessible, it helps everybody. So, and for sure, it helps everybody. For sure. And I I think that while the past few years of education have been something, um, (laughs) I, I have noticed that I really truly believe that the majority of teachers out there are ready and willing to make these steps to remove barriers to access. And I would even go as far to say most administrators out there are also on the page, same page. Um, the problem that often gets in the way is these greater systematic things that make it impractical, impractical to do everything we're supposed to do without something accidentally falling by the wayside. And and I think, I think kind of like teachers want to do good. And I think that we're moving in the right direction. I just hope we can keep that momentum and maybe get move it up a little bit so we can make sure our classrooms are truly a place for everyone. Yes, that is so true. <laughs> and that is exactly how we do it. Like you said, you, you know, educating other people about it and, um, you know, just, just talking about things and, and helping, hoping that, um, you know, that can make a change. So I, um, in our pre-conversation when we were preparing for this through emails and things back and forth, um, you mentioned that you have uh, ADHD and SPD, uh, which are hyper or attention deficit attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and sensory processing disorder. Uh, can you share with us what those diagnoses mean, and um, how those two diagnoses have impacted your life um, specifically and, and your experience? For sure. So I was diagnosed with ADHD very young. Um, I was always that kid that you know 
seems like they're they're running with a motor and you know just just always going from one thing to the next and that really manifested in me went into these these really big outbursts um at the end of the day because no one likes to get in trouble um so i would work really 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 hard to do what i needed to do at school and then by the time i got home i was just spent mm. i i i owe my parents many um many thanks for the amount of patience they had for me <laughs> i remember many many years of really rough afternoons and and th that's kind of where my main manifestation of that diagnosis has come through. Um, but what I love about it, and as I continue to grow as a person, I realize that there are some really cool aspects about it. Like um, with my online business, you know, I fully acknowledge that that all started out with a hyperfixation, um, but it's turned into something so cool that I absolutely love and that is, I, I call it, you know, a hyperfixation for good. Um, and I, I think that, that's kind of the main thing with my ADHD that's kind of affected my life. Um, but then on the flip side of that, with my diagnosis with sensory processing disorder, um, that happened much later. That honestly only happened within the last couple of years um, and it explains a lot. <laughs> um, you know, I was always one that big groups of people would get me, I would I'd start to feel anxious or, you know, bright lights and, oh, you know, walking, walking past a bath and body works was always just a, a whole thing because of all the smells, um, and sounds, you know, I would, I yes. see my, I would get very stimulated, um, which is funny because I'm a music teacher. I'm surrounded by sounds. <laughs> um, but it's been a lot of learning, you know, oh, well, that's why I do that. Or like, Hey, this is a coping skill that you've used. It's not a great one. What else could we include instead? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, sometimes we we don't want a diagnosis because we don't like the label. But for me, at least, getting these diagnoses has allowed me to normalize what I'm feeling and the experiences that, I, that I'm having in my life so that it's not just, well, I guess that's just some weird thing I do. No, it's just the way that my brain works. Um, you know, I, we can definitely dive deeper into this. I think that, you know, clearly these these diagnoses have affected my life in a, a lot of different ways. But I think just overall, they've they've made me realize that my brain works differently than others. And the older I get, the more I realize that that isn't necessarily a bad thing. I love that. I love that. That is, um, you know, it, it's the, you know, we're all different and that's okay. <laughs> You know, we all learn differently and that's okay. It's just, it's okay. It's not a bad thing. Um, I know recently over the last few years, there has been, um, uh, I guess a social media has hashtag that disability is not a bad word. Um, and so that is, uh, you know, it's really great that you uh, have come to realize that and, and you know, have, have learned to uh, accept that. And I, I love <laughs> I love when you talked about the, the Bath and Body Works. It's just like, oh my gosh, you go past and it's the smell just hits you before you even get there to the store. <laughs> I think a lot of For people sure. can relate to that. <laughs> oh, wow. So uh, as you mentioned, you are um, an elementary school teacher, music teacher. Um, I, I am like slightly obsessed with music. I love music, all kinds of music. Um, but how have you found uh, that music has had an um, impact and effect on your uh, ADHD and, and SPD? I mean, it's definitely, I, you know, kind of think about, you know, my, who I am is very much so influenced by my diagnoses. Um, but on the other side of that is who I am as a musician is also very much a part of who I am. It's a huge part of who I am, especially growing up. You know, I was always the one in doing in band and orchestra and choir and doing all the musical theater things. And that was kind of my identity and it still is to a certain degree. Um, but what I, what I've only recently realized is that I think music was one of my longest hyperfixations. And I think the reason why is because it allowed me an opportunity to funnel that focus. It allowed me the opportunity to take this super hyper, hyper focus that can honestly sometimes be very debilitating, wanting to focus so much on something and to put it in something that has this creative output. Um, and to a certain degree, a creative output that other people value because you know with ADHD you can hyper fix it on something and show someone this this wonderful project that you've put hours and hours in and they're like, 
okay, I guess that works. <laughs> but putting it into something, into music, you know, it was able to to normalize the way that I viewed the world. And it was a, a way for me to deal with my emotions and to to um, kind of regulate who I am and the, the way that I was interacting with the world. Um, and honestly, that's just why I love music so much is because it allows me that, that avenue. Um, and then when it comes to, you know, sensory processing disorder, um, there's been a lot of learning and unlearning that I've had to do. I mean, I I teach music all day, every day. We sing, we dance, we play instruments, you know, we get, you know, 20 kindergartners with drums, you know, it's not a quiet situation. <laughs> and there are certain things that I've had to realize that I have to adapt in my classroom to make it more accessible to me. But what mm. I love about it is that it's also, not only is it making it more accessible to my students, but it's also modeling the neurodiversity. For instance, I, in my classroom, I have like over the year headphones, like noise canceling headphones available for anyone that wants them. I have fidgets for available to anyone that wants them. I don't get key to them. I don't say, well, you can only use this if, if X, Y, Z, anyone can use them. Just today, I had my fourth graders all individually practicing rec recorders. It was loud. I'm <laughs> sitting there wearing my headphones because I'm like, you know what? I'm modeling what this is because I know that if I don't do that, I'm going to be a real grump the next period when, because I'm mm. overstimulated. And what I love about the way that I'm implementing these strategies for myself is that students are able to see that I'm an adult, an adult in, you know, in their lives that is advocating for themselves and is taking the same accommodations that they might need later on. Wow. That is, that's great. And I love that. Um, yeah, again, you're you're making it okay. You're making it okay that to say like, okay, this is loud, and I need I need these uh, noise canceling headphones on for a minute, like, cause that's uh, it's a bit much. Um, so that that's really uh, really cool. So this is uh, wasn't one of my questions that I had planned to ask, but what instruments do you play? Oh, that's that's a wide wide question. So, <laughs> so I my my primary instrument was voice. I started oh, singing. God. My parents say before I started even talking, um, and I've been you know taking voice lessons since a very young young age. Started choir in the fifth grade and have never stopped. Um, in the fifth grade, I started playing the viola. In the sixth grade, I started playing the French horn. Um, oh, wow. In college, I learned the piano. Um, and then as an, a, a music ed major, I had to learn like the basics of all the other instruments. So like I did some woodwind stuff and some brass stuff. And like, <laughs> you know, I so I guess I have a working understanding on a lot of the major oh, wow. instruments. But, it, you know, if you were to say, all right, go make some music, I would probably, which is funny saying this now because I struggled so much in college on piano. Um, but I would go play something on the piano and sing. And I, I think that that is the the way that my music music making tends to go now these days wow that's cool i um <clears throat> because i have a physical disability i could not play sports growing up um so my parents uh put me into music lessons <laughs> so the first two i i tried um were two instruments they wanted me to try the piano and guitar um i wanted to play the drums <laughs> 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 so I did, I, I got a chance to play, you know, to, to try all three. Um, I wouldn't know how to play any of them at this point. Um, but yeah, music has always been something, um, something very important in my life. I always, um, you know, I, I listen to music just about every day and um, we're recording this uh, on February 7th. So the Grammys were a couple nights ago. So I watched the Grammys um, a couple nights ago, which was great. The 50 years of hip hop uh, thing that they did was really cool and <laughs> had a great, uh, a lot of great performances. Um, so that kind of leads us into uh, the last question that I have, which is, um, can you give us one song or a few songs that you think everyone should listen to? <laughs> oh, so I'm going to take this in a really like, strange way but yes. <laughs> i think you should listen to the song that you need in that moment you know sometimes we need a song that is going to match the emotions we're feeling you know if you're feeling sad sometimes you might want to play a sad song but sometimes you need a song that's going to be the opposite of what you're feeling to help get you to the next place and to help you move through um to me, my song that I listen to the most is this song. Oh, I can't even, I don't even remember who it's by, but it's like, it's called Live Like a Warrior. 
um let me see if i can uh, by matsu yahoo uh, it's this like reggae song and it's it to me it, i've learned i've heard this song first in high school but it you know it's all about living like a warrior don't worry about you know don't worry about yesterday worry about today and to put your best step fo foot forward and just kind of do your thing and that's one thing that i need to hear a lot and i I like to live my life in the way that I'm going, going to live it. And I think that, you know, whatever song you want to listen to and need in that moment, that's the song you should listen to. That was a great way to answer that. And I love, um, I love that because like, like you said, sometimes, you know, when you're in a happy mood, you want to listen to a happy song. And sometimes when you're in a sad mood, you don't want to listen to a sad song. So, you know, you do want to listen to the opposite of, of how you're feeling. Um, and, and that's really uh, the joy, I think, of music and the uh, the variety of music that is out there. Um, For sure. So I, I can't wait to listen to the song you just mentioned, though. I uh, have to check that out after we're done. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's really, um, again, it's really great. Um, I'm really happy to have you join me today on this episode just to share your story and give a little insight into um, who you are and the work that you're doing um, with your students and outside of school where you're helping other educators and um, educating other ed other educators uh, and just trying to make a difference in, in the world. So I appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk with me today, Bryson, and uh, thank you so much. For sure. You know, I, I really appreciate having these conversations and just kind of as a final point, you know, I think there are, are so many things that I get blessed to be a part of my students' lives. And I think that the one that I don't take for granted the most is the fact that I am a positive model in life of someone who's living my life exactly how I am. And hopefully, you know, my students will be able to see themselves and me in certain aspects. So if my if some of my students also get overstimulated, they'll see that there's a person that made it through the other side and they're living with it. And, you know, I think that that is, regardless of your life, of your truth, of your disability status, of whatever, being a model for other people to realize that the way you are matters and the way you are is perfectly valid is something that we should scream from the rooftop. Absolutely. And um, do you have any um, websites or social media sites of yours that you would like to share where people can follow you? I would love to um, have that uh, available for people. <laughs> For sure. The best place to follow me is on Instagram at that music teacher. I am on TikTok under the same name, um, or you can head over to that music teacher.com. Great. So thank you again, Bryson, for your time today. And I am uh, very grateful to have had you as a guest. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> this concludes this episode of the Our View podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on all social media platforms at Our View for Life. That's O-U-R-V-I-E-W, the number four, L-I-F-E. If you have a topic or a person, or if you are a person who would like to be interviewed for an upcoming episode of the podcast, send us a DM on Instagram, send us a message on Facebook, or you can email me at ourviewforlife at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.